poor people would then come into the bazaar from what exactly what happened in a very long story I'll make. You say somebody is Karim. Chapter 10 to chapter 47, they are all revealed in Mecca. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Let me help. I'm the closest person to the king. I'm not going to allow you to. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The 38th chapter from the Holy Quran was descended in the holy city of Mecca with 88 verses. And indeed, once we recite the 38th chapter, Surah Sad, we realize that Surah Sad is a continuation of the message of Surah As-Safat, which was number 37. However, there is a big question here. Was Surah Sad revealed after Surah As-Safat? So that it contains a continued message? The answer is no. And this is why I would like to introduce two very important notions from the Holy Quran to you this evening. One is that scholars of tafsir, some of the scholars of tafsir believe that the very first ayat of every chapter are connected to the last ayat of the chapter. So a notion, a theme, a phenomenon is introduced within a chapter, within a surah, in the very early ayat. And then we are reminded in the conclusion of the chapter with the same message, with the same theme. So that we understand whatever is mentioned in between is actually an explanation of this grand theme within the surah. And obviously, that is something that I also believe in by examining every ch chapter. I believe there is some sort of connection between the beginning and the end of every surah. And we can take a look. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the chapter Prior to this, chapter 37, he speaks of وَالصَّافَّاتِ صَفَّا فَالزَّاجِرَاتِ زَجْرَا فَالتَّالِيَاتِ ذِكْرَا إِنَّ إِلَاهَكُمْ لَوَاحِدْ And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks um, of the angels <coughs> in this chapter, description of the angels. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, and the end of Surah As-Safat as well makes a reference to the very beginning of it. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. And prior to that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a reference to the angels. Here, Allah again in chapter 38, Sad wal Qur'ani the dhikr bal al-ladheena kafaru fi izzatin wa shiqaq. In the end of the chapter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again speaks of dhikr. In huwa illa dhikrun lil'alameen. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins every chapter and ends every chapter with the same theme. That's one. Number two is that every chapter is a continuation of the message of the chapter prior to it. They're somehow connected. They're somehow related. Now obviously this is not a chronicle order of the dissension of the chapters. And here is where the grand miracle of the Quran lies. What do I mean? This is the first part, the first notion, the first phenomenon. Is that a chapter begins with ends with the same message. The second one is that each chapter is connected to the one prior to it. And obviously this is not a chronicle order of dissension of the chapters. No. If we look at the chapters and the way they were revealed, it's much different than how, it, how they are organized here. And I believe this is a miracle of the Qur'an. This is one of the greatest miracles of the Qur'an. That it was revealed in a manner which was miraculous to the, to the people of its time. Meaning that when... Something occurred when there was an event, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descended and revealed an ayah that spoke of that event. So it is very important for us to examine the event to understand why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayah so that we understand the Qur'an's reaction towards our day-to-day -day events. Because history repeats itself. The events that occurred in the time of Rasulullah will occur now. We want to understand the event, we want to understand the situation and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reacted to it. How did Allah react to it? With an ayah, with a chapter, with a surah. For example, the Christians gathered, they came to Rasulullah, Rasulullah greeted them, they spoke to him, they had a delegation, and the delegation asked Rasulullah questions. The delegation left, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed an entire chapter in response to the questions of the Christians that had come with that forth with, within that uh, delegation to Rasulullah. We are, if we understand why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this entire chapter, to respond to the questions and the allegations of the Christians, we then would be able to make better decisions when we deal with Christians or Jews or the people of the book. That if they ask us a question, if they pose a question to us, if they have a misunderstanding, do we prioritize that or not? Do we respond to that or not? Or do we just ignore it? No. Just like the Qur'an prioritized responding to them, prioritized this ongoing dialogue with them, prioritize not keeping any misconceptions between the Muslims, Islam, the religion of Islam, the Qur'an and the people of the book, we must keep that as a priority for us as well. Other people come and tell Rasulullah, we love our parents, we love our parents. We cannot just ignore our parents because of the fact that we have now converted to Islam and they are not Muslim. What do we do? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals ayat there speaking about this incident, making sure that people understand that the fact that they are your parents never changes. And if they, because they differ from you in faith, or religion, try to take you astray from Allah in that area, do not follow them. In that specific area where they want you to disobey God, don't follow them. But, وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا معروفة. But when you reject them, when you say, look, I'm not going to listen to you, I'm convinced this is the religion I want to follow, still be kind to them, still be gracious with them, still show mercy and kindness to them, be humble with them. Similarly, a wife has a problem with her husband. Allah reveals a chapter. Other people are trying to get married. They don't have money. Allah reveals an ayah. When we understand the background behind the sabab al nuzul we then can make a better understanding of the Qur'an and make better decisions according to the Qur'an within our lives. That's one. So this was the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. That it spoke so eloquently every time there was an event. However, the Qur'an was already revealed in Laylat al-Qadr. And every time, within the 23 years, you see, let me ex explain something. Within 23 years, the Qur'an was being revealed in small bits and pieces. But in Laylat al-Qadr, the entire Qur'an would be revealed to Rasulullah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the Qur'an, but also when events took place, bits and pieces were revealed, which shows that this Qur'an is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows the future and who knows the events, who knows what will happen and how he will react to it. But yet he's revealed this Qur'an prior to it happening. This was the first miraculous nature of the Qur'an. And second is how Allah then ordered for this Qur'an to be compiled. Because that Qur'an was miraculous for the time of the Muslim community then. Listen. But is the Qur'an only for that time? Is the Qur'an only for that community then? The Qur'an is an eternal book. The Qur'an is meant to guide people for the rest of times. 
So Allah changed the structure of the Qur'an from the chronicle order to this order. Why this order? Because this order is the most comprehensive for any person to begin studying the Qur'an. And that is why the messages continue. Each chapter is connected to the one prior to it. Chapter 37 is connected to 36. 36 is connected to 35. 35 is connected to 34 and likewise. But you know where the greatest miracle now lies? You would love this. From chapter 10 to chapter 47, they are all revealed in Mecca. So only makes sense that, you know, they're somehow related, connected, that's fine. But therefore lies four chapters within this list from 10 to 47 that were revealed in Medina and not revealed in Mecca. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders that four out of 37 break the sequence why? Because the ones in Medina now fit right in this part of the Qur'an. Chapter 13, chapter 22, chapter 24, and chapter 33 are the ones that break this rhythm of the chapters revealed in Mecca, one, and after, one after another. Break the sequence. Why? If you go and you read them and you study them, you realize alaykum as salam that they are part of making this, creating this beautiful picture, drawing this beautiful picture of the Holy Qur'an. This is something very important for those who actually like to study the Qur'an, who actually like to make time when they read the Qur'an, they study its rhythms, they study why this chapter is here, why this ayah is here, and to have an extremely unique relationship with the Qur'an. Like I said, you know, the Qur'an is truly an, an alive book. It's an alive entity. And you can really have an amazing relationship with the Qur'an. But you just have to desire that relationship. You have to want that relationship. And the more time you spend with the Qur'an, you, the more fascinated you will be by the Qur'an. Believe me. So this is a continuation. What I was trying to say is this is a continuation of chapter 37. Chapter 37, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of many prophets, right? Allah introduces many of the prophets that came and they spoke to their nation and they spoke to their people and they tried to deliver this message to them. Allah similarly here continues to speak of them, but now Allah continues this message. That's those prophets that came and they reminded the people they were... The majority of them were rejected, ridiculed. They were mocked. They were not respected. Anyways, let's begin with the, with, the, um, with the chapter and you will have some more clarity. Sa'ad wal-Qur'ani dhikr Obviously, Sa'ad is the broken letter that we have spoken to in the previous nights. Wal-Qur'an speaks of the Qur'an itself. You know, sometimes we ask the Prophet to introduce the Qur'an to us. Sometimes Imam Ali introduces the Qur'an to us. Sometimes some of the Imams introduce the Qur'an to us. Sometimes some of the Sahaba, like Abdullah ibn Abbas, they introduce the Qur'an to us. And sometimes the Qur'an introduces itself. Sometimes the Qur'an speaks of itself. So the Qur'an here speaks of itself and says, Sad wal Qur'ani the dhikr. Now, the Qur'an speaks of itself and describes itself as being dhikr. What is dhikr? Dhikr is remembrance, right? Dhikr is remembrance. But what is the difference between the dhikr and dhikr? The difference is sometimes you say somebody is jawad. Meaning what? Meaning he is generous. And sometimes you say dhul jud. Meaning he is full of generosity. You say somebody is Karim. Then you say somebody is Dhu Karam. Somebody is generous, but then you describe them in a different way by saying no, they are the embodiment of generosity. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes refers to the Quran as dhikr and at other times the dhikr. 
meaning the embodiment of remembrance, the embodiment of being the best of reminders for human beings. How so? We'll know. كفروا, but those who are rejectful, the kafirs, those who have rejected the message of the prophets prior to you, and your message, في عزة وشقاق. What is عزة? عزة is when somebody is overtaken by pride. And by arrogance. They were so arrogant, they were so full of pride, that listen, you Muhammad, you really think that you know better than us? Why would God choose you above us? What's so special about you? We're rich, we're famous, we're powerful, and you are below us in status. How can you claim that you have been chosen by God? God should have chosen someone rich, someone famous, someone powerful. وَشِقَاق عِزَّةٍ وَشِقَاق Shiqaq is, it means they have been cut off. What is shaqi? Shaqi is somebody who's been cut off. Cut off from what? The mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those people have been cut off from the remembrance of Allah, from being reminded of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to them. Then Allah says, كَمْ أَهْلَكْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ How many nations prior to them that they knew of? قَوْمْ صَالِحْ قَوْمْ لُوْتْ قَوْمْ نُوْحْ كَمْ أَهْلَكْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ مِنْ قَرْنٍ From tribes. And, and nations, do they not know? Do they not remember? Why are they so ignorant? مِنْ قَرْنٍ فَنَادَوْا وَلَا تَحِينَ مَنَاصْ وَعَجِبُوا This is the response to the second ayah. This is the response to the second ayah. What is it? وَعَجِبُوا أَنْ جَاءَهُمْ مُنْذِرٌ مِنْهُمْ وَقَالَ الْكَافِرُونَ هَذَا سَاحِرٌ كَذَّابٌ How can there be a messenger from us, amongst us, one of us. Why is he not an angel? What they were trying to say, listen, what they were trying to say is, look, you were always with us. You were always in Mecca. It's not like you went somewhere, something happened and you became a prophet. If you're bringing some news, if you're bringing something special to us, you just can't be one of us. You have to be somebody from the outside. Somebody who... You know, something happened to him because he was outside this compound, outside this tribe, outside this city. You learned something when you were gone. You saw something when you were gone. You felt something when you were gone. But you're always with us. So what? So you cannot be a prophet. Why would God choose you as a prophet? Therefore, you are a sahar. You're a magician. And you are a majnoon. Either a magician or you've lost your sanity. Why? أَجَعَلَ آلِحَةً إِلَاهًا وَاحِدًا He says all those gods now have to turn into one. إِنْ هَذَا إِنَّ هَذَا لَشَيْءٌ عُجَابٌ That's something very shocking. Who would say that all those idols, all those gods now have to turn into one god? And if you look at this chapter, this chapter is then divided into several segments. One is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of the relationship and the response of the Arabs towards Rasulullah. So the response was what? Azzatim wa shiqaq. They had arrogance towards the message of God. And number two, they were cut off from this remembrance. Every time they were reminded, they didn't want to listen. They didn't want to pay attention. They didn't want to be reminded. And obviously until today, when you introduce religion, when you speak of religion, when you speak of religious issues, you find the people that are the ultra-rich and wealthy, they don't want to have anything to do with religion. But wh Because why do I need religion? Usually people come to God when they are in need, when they're not as rich, when they feel that you know one day their money is going gonna, is gonna to finish and vanish. So let's have a good relationship with God because of the fact that you know, we don't want to go bankrupt. But when they're so rich, when they're so wealthy, they think that even God can't you know, take away their wealth. 
In fact, that's exactly what happened in a very long story. I'll make it very short. They say on the day of Eid, such as the day of tomorrow or the day after, depending on when you will celebrate Eid. They say that in Iran and Isfahan, people would open up their bazaar, the bazaar of uh, the, uh, the gold sellers. And the poor people would then come into the bazaar from one end and leave from the other end and they would take a little bit of money from each store, right? So a lady got into the largest store and she said, you know, I, I'm here to take my Eid gift. And, you know, they would maybe give $10, $5. I don't know what is equivalent, obviously. This story is it's quite old. So this old lady reaches a store and she tells him, you know, I would like my idea. And she, he, says to her, he says to her, I ran out. That's it. I don't have any more. So she, sa he said, she says to him, you ran out of pennies. You ran out of quarters. You ran out of, you know, one dollar bill. Give me a 20. Give me a hundred. Look how rich you are. You can afford it. It's the day of Eid. So he says, you know, get out of here. And uh, she says to him, listen, are you not afraid that one day God can make you as poor as me? Are you not afraid of that? Are you not afraid that one day you will be broke and you would have to beg when you treat If you have a sa'il, a beggar, somebody's asking you, and they don't have to literally beg. Maybe they email you. Maybe they call you. They want help. Maybe they have dignity. They can't come and beg you in front of everyone. This is Allah. Allah is warning us. Do not say no. If you can't, say I can't. I really, genuinely, if you can't, say I can't give you a thousand dollars. I can't give you this loan. But I can give you five hundred dollars. I can't give you a loan of ten thousand dollars. But I can give you three thousand dollars. I cannot gift you, for example, you want to, somebody got in a car accident. They need their car to go to work. They're not being lazy. Obviously, we don't encourage you to give those who are lazy. We encourage you to give those who are trying their best, but they just can't in, in, make ends meet. And they come and say, look, my car broke down. I can't go to work. I need $1,000 to fix my car. You don't have 1000 Give them 200 Give them 300 Help them. وَأَمَّا السَّائِلَ فَلَا تَنْهَرْ so he looks at her and he says, you know what? Even if God would want to make me as poor as you, it would take him at least 10 years. This is the response of this arrogant man to the old lady. Why? فِي عِزَّةٍ وَشِقَاقٍ We are intoxicated with how much money we have, with the car we drive with how people respect us and they think that you know because ultimately unfortunately you see in our, even in our communities the communities of the mu'mineen and believers who's respected somebody who memorizes the quran somebody who's read more books somebody who does salat al-layl or somebody who has more money So when we treat people that have more money like that, we put them in that state of izzatin wa shiqaq. Anyhow, this old lady left the store. As soon as she left the store, the guards of the shah came into the store. They shut down the whole bazaar. They said there is a fugitive here. Whoever we find this fugitive with, we will take all his wealth, all his assets, and then we will hang him in the middle of the bazaar. And they searched every store until they reached his store. So as soon as they reached his store, he says, you know what? The queen, your queen was just here shopping for me. Do you think you, I'm going to allow you to search my store? I'm a special friend of the king. I'm the closest person to the king. I'm not going to allow you to search my store. So they searched the whole bazaar again. They came to him. They said, look, we know the fugitive is here. We have to search your store. If you're a 
a friend of the king, you're not going to give refuge to somebody who, someone who tried to assassinate the king. And yes, that fugitive happened to be in his store. So within 10 minutes, within one hour, then they read the verdict that whoever we find the fugitive with, all his assets will then belong to the government. They stripped him of all his assets. They, take, they took him to hang him. He said, go and ask the king. The king said, take his money, but leave him. Because he was a good friend of ours. Leave him, don't hang him. And he then became poorer than that old lady. Today, a lot of people, because they have so much money, they think they're untouchable. Allah cannot make him broke. Allah cannot make him go bankrupt. And for Allah, it's... إِذَا أَرَادَ شَيْئًا أَنْ يَقُولَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ So this is the first segment. Speaks of the reaction of Quraysh and the reaction of the people similar to Quraysh prior to Rasulullah. كَمْ أَهْلَكْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ مِنْ قَرْنٍ So many nations did the same thing and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished them for their wrongdoings. This is the second Notion, but it's throughout the whole chapter. But it's introduced in the very first beginning of the chapter. So the beginning of the chapter introduces the theme. Then third, Allah gives solidarity to the Muslims and to Rasulullah by speaking of the prophets prior to them. So what is the main theme of this chapter, brothers and sisters? Who can tell me the main theme in one word of this entire chapter, Surah Sad? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Let me help you. Sad wal Quran the dhikr. What's the theme? Dhikr. The Quran. The the theme is dhikr, and that is why you find this word dhikr remembrance throughout the entire chapter, more frequently used in this chapter than any other chapter in the Holy Quran. For example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he speaks in ayah number 29 kitabun anzalnahu ilayka mubarakun liyadabbaru ayatihi 29 and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again waliyatadhakkara ulul albab in chapter and verse number 41, what does he say? 41? 41? abdana. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds him, وَذْكُرْ abdana Ayyub. And let me remind you of Ayyub. And ayah number 45, what does he say? Those who have no Quran are failing this class today. وَذْكُرْ عَبْدَنَا Allah in, chap, in ayah number 48 What does he say? وَذْكُرْ Ismail In 49 So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frequently uses the word dhikr The word dhikr remembrance is there where in the very first ayah Allah introduces the, the, the theme Sad wal Qurani the dhikr. It will remind us of what? It will remind us of the day of judgment. It will remind us of the mercy of Allah. It will remind us that Allah is the most forgiving, that Allah is the most compassionate. It will remind us of the blessings of God unto us. It will remind us of our death. It will remind us of our graves. It will remind us of the day that we stand in front of Allah and we are judged. It reminds us of the day that we were born. It reminds us of our families. It it's a reminder. It reminds us of prophets before us. It reminds us of how Allah treated those who were righteous and pious. It reminds us of those who were part of the alliance of Satan as the Quran describes it. So it's a reminder. Constant reminder. In every aspect of our lives. One of the reminders is in ayah number 17 onwards. Where the prophet Dawood 
is mentioned in detail. وَاصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا يَقُولُونَ وَذْكُرْ عَبْدَنَا دَاوُودِ ذُو الْأَيْدِي إِنَّهُ أَحْسَنَتْ First of all, Ya Rasulullah, اصبر على ما يقولون. Be patient with what they say. Don't be so hurt but what, by what they say. Why? Because Rasulullah was literally putting his life on the line. Working day and night, not asking them for any money, not asking them for any power, not asking them for any reimbursement. He wasn't asking them for anything. I'm not asking you for anything in return. And what would they say about him that he's a magician, that he has lost his sanity? That he is corrupting their society. So Rasulullah would be hurt. Yes, Rasulullah would be hurt. And this goes to every person who deals with a teacher, with a mentor, with a figure that is literally dedicated his life to them. Are we appreciative? Do we appreciate that person? Do we let them know we appreciate them? Do we support them at least verbally? One of, I said one of the ways that we communicate love is by words of affirmation, by beautiful words. Do we do that? Have we taught ourselves to do that? So they, Rasulullah would be hurt because many of them, they were not thankful. And some of them, most of them were critical of him. They accused him, they harassed him verbally. So Allah says, Ya Rasulullah, وَصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا يَقُولُونَ Be patient. Let, don't let it hurt you. وَاذْكُرْ عَبْدَنَا And remind yourself of your fellow prophet who was a abd. Abd is a servant of Allah who is truly a slave, a submissive slave to the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who? Dawood. ذُو الْأَيْدِي إِنَّهُ awab. He was awab. Allah describes him as awab. Who is awab? What does awab mean? Huh? Yes, mashaAllah. I would like the brothers only, the brothers, to make a salawat for the sisters. And obviously we know why, right? Because their number has always been more than you. And they know more Qur'an than you. I've realized this in the past couple of nights. So I give them an A. And if you would like to pass, you know, you have to try harder now. Innahu awab. Awab is a person with a lot of tawbah, which is good, alhamdulillah, because they are the ones taking care of the children. So inshallah, the children will have plenty of Qur'an at home. They will learn the Qur'an. And we then will have a balanced structure in the Qur'an. Uh, 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 of the Quran within the family because the job of the father is not just to treat the home like a bed and breakfast go home go go to work all day come home eat next day breakfast shower out the door no it's also to learn the Quran to teach the Quran and to spend some quality time with the children and with the religion at home inshallah so Allah says this Dawood he was awab he was he would do a lot of tawbah was he a, a big sinner so that every day he, he would do tawbah? No. Sometimes, you know, sometimes we, we think of certain things. And this is obviously we, average people, not prophets. Prophet are, prophets are in a much higher level of purification. But we as normal human beings, sometimes we don't sin. But to remember we've thought of something and, we, and it's, not, it's not the thought of a mu'min and a believer. So we say, astaghfirullah. Sometimes we not purposely, without intention, we look at something and we say, you know, we have to seek istighfar because the eyes of a mu'min should not be glancing in such a way. Or we say something, it's a slip of the tongue, we don't mean it. But then we realize we made a mistake, so we say astaghfirullah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the tawwab. As soon as you realize you've made a mistake, you fix it. Also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the sinners who repent. In fact, we have a hadith that says Allah has left the door of tawbah open because we forget, we human beings are forgetful. 
We forget we did a tawbah. So if we fall into the trap of shaitan again. We make a sin again. And every time we sin, we don't return to Allah. Allah has upset. When we sin, and we say, khalas, I sin, but what am I going to do? But every time we sin, and we return to Allah, and we do tawbah, Allah loves that tawbah. Allah loves that tawbah more than anything. Why? Because we understand that we're sinning. We are returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then obviously I don't have time to engage in the other verses except verse number 20. With this we conclude. وَشَدَدْنَا mulka, And we gave him a firm kingdom. A very firm kingdom. How was it firm? Was it firm because <coughs> some scholars say he had 40,000 people protecting him. 40,000 from jinn, malaika, angels, human beings and animals. 40,000 40, Guards would protect Dawood. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Even the, the, the mountains would protect him. And what tayr and the, the birds would also be part of his kingdom, part of his protection plan. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَشَدَدْنَا مُلْكَهُ Does it mean that, you know, this, this is his... No. Some scholars believe because he was protected by angels and by human beings. But others say no. وَشَدَدْنَا mulkah means we have given him the ability to be a strong leader. We have made him a brave leader. We have made him a firm leader. Let me ask you, will a coward leader ever be able to bring dignity to his people? A leader who is a coward himself, would he be able to deliver his nation towards their freedom and justice? No. So Allah says, وَشَدَدْنَا مُلْكَهُ We made him brave. We gave him a firm leadership. وَآتَيْنَاهُ الْحِكْمَةِ And we gave him hikmah. We gave him wisdom. How so? We made him wise enough to understand that he has to treat everybody in his kingdom equally. Not that if he's a Christian, then he loves the Christians, and not the Jews, and not the Hindus, and not the Muslims. He, if he is white, then he loves white people versus other people. If he is, for example, of a certain caliber of society, then that's, that's the people he loves. No, hikmah, wisdom of a leader is that he treats everybody equally. He makes everyone happy. He does not take one side over the other. Even maybe, maybe within him, he's a Muslim, he's a Christian, he's a Jew, he likes his own people. But when it comes to treating them, he treats them fairly with equality. And number three, وَفَصْلَ khitab. And when he speaks, he speaks with justice, firmly. He does not speak with a matter that is unwise. And one man who had this great quality, who had fasl al-khitab, who had hikmah in the way he treated people was Amir al-Mu'mineen. He treated the poor and the young and the Arab and the non-Arab and the Christian and the non-Christian equally. And when he spoke, he spoke with the utmost eloquence. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.